everyone. Welcome to my podcast. This is Ann P. of Fiber, Floss, and Fiction, and I'm coming to you today on Wednesday, September 30th, 2020, so almost October. Uh, welcome to all of my viewers. If you're a new viewer, I hope you have a reason to come back and visit with me and click the subscribe button. And as always, thank you to my returning viewers who choose to come back and spend some time with me I was going to say every week, but that doesn't happen. So as I film things, so um, everything here is good. My husband and I had a little getaway for about a week. We just drove up to Southern Colorado. It's, we went to Durango, which is about four hours from our house, um, mostly because there's not really a direct route. So the back roads are a little bit slow, but, um, we went and camped, so we did as much social distancing as we could and then wore our masks everywhere we couldn't, um, which really wasn't much. We had to do some supply shopping one day, you know, just basic stuff that you run out of, like the bread and milk list um, and garbage bags. So we did a quick shop um, and then other than that, we spent a lot of time hiking. We took our dog, so we had lovely walks. Um, if you followed me at all on uh, Instagram, I had posted some photos of those. So we really enjoyed ourselves. It was great to get out of the house. Um, I'm never very good at thinking I need a vacation, but after I have a vacation, I think I should have taken that, like I should take time off, which I hardly ever do. So it was very, very well needed and definitely delightful. As a result though, um, I have not recorded in like 20 days and I had time off so there's a lot of stuff to talk about today. So I think we're just going to go ahead and jump right in. Um, you might want a beverage and crafty thing of your choice in order for us to get started because um, I think you'll want all of those things. All right, so what have I been working on? Let's start with knitting. Um, I finished this up just before we left. This is actually a hand spun project. This is uh, half of a club package I received in 2011, I think it was, uh, from Fat Cat Knits. Ginny is now actually dying again, so I will link to her below. Um, this is her, her autumn club from that year. And the way that she worked the club is she sent two two and a half ounce braids of fiber. So this is a half of the club. It's a two and a half ounce uh, braid of basically worsted weight two ply, blue face luster, and the colorway is country roads. It's half of the country roads colorway. So I spun that up um, just because I'm trying to work through a lot of older stash. I've got the second half, which is like a coordinating color, uh, less blues and more kind of the oranges, um, like orange and reds that you think of for fall colors. Um, but here is this one done. I love spinning blue face luster. It spins up very quickly, nicely, hard wearing, all that good stuff. Okay, moving on. Y'all ready? There's, I've got four finished knitting projects and one almost finished knitting project. So, uh, I have been on a hat kick this year, which I think if you've watched me before, you know. Uh, I finished up this cute little pattern, which is called November Leaves um, by Melissa Labar, I think is how she says her name, Knitting School Dropout. And I will put all of the Ravelry page links to the patterns that I talk about below so you can access them there. Um, they have made some upgrades to the site so if you haven't been there in a little while check it out. Um, there's actually a toggle button now in your in your profile settings where you can turn off any of the moving things that might still crop up uh, if they were giving you headaches or other problems so sidebar. November leaves. Um, this is a worsted weight hat pattern, super simple. All of the rest is stockinette, except for that cute little panel of lace leaves, which I love. Uh, spiral decrease on the crown. Hopefully that's showing up at your end. It sort of is at mine. Um, 
This is slated for a big charity box that I'm sending to my mom for her church's outreach. Uh, they do, um, they sponsor like a homeless shelter in downtown Baltimore. And so they do meals and warm woolies over the winter months. So this, this will go in the box. Uh, I knit this using, oddly enough, the actual called for fiber from the pattern, which is um, Brooklyn Tweed's worsted weight which is shelter and the colorway is faded quilt um, which is a heathery kind of blue gray it's got some flecks of turquoise and white in it as well as like a darker gray um, I do not love the Brooklyn Tweed yarns for seaming up but if all you're doing is a hat it's perfectly fine um, so this one is done and off the needles, obviously, ready to go in the box. And then I have another hat that I knit using very deep stash Rowan felted tweed. This is the DK weight. This pattern is from Tin Can Knits and it's called Cleoquat, which I think is a place name of something in Canada. Any of my Canada viewers, maybe you can educate me on that, but um, it's the Cleoquat toque. So just kind of a beanie shape again has a spiral rib or a spiral decrease top which I think is really great. Fun color work pattern for the brim. I don't know not the crown and not the ribbing the other part that's in between. Um, this is a great yarn for very lightweight but warm items because it has an alpaca um, component to it and also Tweety, which I am all into this year apparently. And I have, I think it's six different balls of felted tweed sitting in, um, just found some random yarn in my pocket. Um, sitting in my stash, I knit a sweater design out of this yarn about five years ago. Excuse me, allergy season here still yet again. Um, so I don't really have enough to do like a whole garment of anything, but I use probably between two thirds and three quarters of one ball for the main color. And I think the two contrast colors, like the cinnamon burnt orange color only took about 10 yards for this size and the dark green was maybe 30 or 35 yards so I have their 190 skein balls. I have a lot left and I certainly can knit a whole bunch of these up. I knit this in two days. It's a super easy DK weight pattern. If you haven't tackled um, stranded knitting or fair isle before this would be a good one to try because the pattern is pretty short and You'll see here, this row here in the middle does have you working with three colors because there's a green and then the orange and then the green and then the background. But if you didn't want to do that, you could either do all three stitches green or you could go back in and stitch over duplicate stitch, that center stitch, if, if you prefer not to work with three colors at once. It's not super hard. It's just a little bit more time consuming. So... Um, another one that will go into the um, charity hat bin um, and on its way to my folks not, not too long in the future. Hopefully, hoping to get that out to them this week. Okay, next, I finished this shawl. This is the geology shawl and it is from Busy Monkey and... It's a single skein project, although I did some of the mods that she included in the project. So I used all but I think it was four yards. Played a little yarn chicken at the end on this long edge bind off. Um, so each section has a different pattern to it. There's basic stockinette, seed stitch, this lace pattern, which makes these pretty little arches, which I really like. Um, this is a knit pearl textured pattern. She calls it the elevator pattern. I'm not sure if it has another name out there. Um, below that is a star pattern and then feather and fan. The yarn is from Spun Right Round 
and uh, I will include her Renee's shop link below. This is the colorway Corset Factory and it is in her basic sock yarn, um, which has really nice yardage, 435 yards uh, to the skein. So the things that I did differently on this one, I, you have the option to add another set of repeats of the star pattern, which I did because I thought half of this was going to be too small for my tastes. And then I also added a second repeat of the feather and fan pattern here. All this is in the, the pattern. So, I mean, this was not me doing anything super exciting. Um, I did use a Pico bind off so that I could have this kind of um, bumpy edge to it. And then I pinned it out into very loose uh, arches. And so it's not a huge shawl, but it is, you know, plenty big for like inside your coat to kind of wear as a cowl. And I think with a shawl pin, you could wear it around your shoulders. Although I don't, I don't think I personally would ever wear it that way. Uh, but I really loved working the pattern. It worked up super quick and was kind of a fun little potato chip knit because there's so much going on in each of the sections, right? You don't really get bored with any of them or by the time you're getting bored, you're ready to switch to, to the next section. So I haven't decided if I'll keep this one or if that might be gifted away. I'm on the fence. Um, my winter coat is purple, but it's blue purple and not red purple, which this is so We'll see. Um, fun knit nevertheless, and hey, I'm knitting a whole bunch out of stash right now, so that's all good. All right, the next thing I finished, let me get them on my sock blockers. Sorry, was not apparently well enough prepared for these. Um, this pair you saw me working on last time we talked, I believe. I have four pairs of socks that I'm trying to make between now and the end of November for kind of a challenge in one of the Ravelry groups. And this is the first of the four that I decided to work up. Um, okay, these are the Kelpie socks. Uh, the designer is called This Handmade Life. And you can see that they're asymmetrical so this is the this is the right sock and this is the left sock so you'd ha you have the um, kind of whale tail cable running on the outside part as you're looking at the front of your leg on the outside edge of it over your ankle um, I did the contrast heels and toes as written this pattern is a little bit loosey-goosey because it shows it with the contrast heel and toe, but it doesn't tell you when to change or how to do that. So if you've never knit a contrast heel and toe before, you'll either have to puzzle it out or ask someone how to do that because there's no information in the pattern on it. I also, um, so I knit the right sock first, which worked out fine. I followed the, the setup for the cable and everything else. That was great. When I got to this sock, I could not get the numbers to work out to move the cable over to the other side. Uh, so I did a little number fudging on my own, but it all came out okay. I do really like this textured rib. Um, it's kind of a mistake stitch rib. It's stretchy, but not crazy stretchy. Um, the yarn, which I think I may have mentioned wrong last time I talked to you all, is from People Loo Fields. Uh, again, I will link to the shops below. Colorway is called Abigail. It's her basic sock. It's the 7525 Superwash Merino and Nylon blend in this great speckled dye color, which I love. And then I pulled a mini skein, actually, that I had left over from dyeing up the Advent kits. Uh, that I'm doing with the yarn guys and um, so it's not a named colorway but it's my Rhiannon sock which is the same base from the same mill. There's only but so many mills. Um, 
yeah, to finish those off. So really happy with how those came out. Um, I then started, oh, so that's all my finished knitting projects for right now. I then started um, a pair of socks from Helen Stewart's most recent Sock Society collection. Helen is on Ravelry as Curious Handmade. And um, every year she kind of does a theme with her sock club and this year's theme I believe is light. So these are the ambient socks. So I have sock one done, which you can see here. Um, interestingly, you kind of can't really see this textured pattern in the modeled shots, right? Because they're shot like this way. So you see all the pretty lace on the front. And I thought it went to the back, but it doesn't. But this is awesome. This is a great little textured pattern that kind of mirrors what you're doing with the lace. Um, one by one, uh, twisted rib. Got the lace pattern that goes all the way down the sock foot. Um, contrast heels and toes, which Helen does tell you when to put those in. Um, and regular heel flap, slip stitch heel. So I have one of these finished and I am oh so very close on sock number two. I have the bulk of the sock knitting done, I think. Yeah, it looks like it. I just have the, the toe to put in. I just finished this last repeat um, sitting on a conference call. Thank you, Zoom. Um, so this one's ready to be finished up. I'm gonna try to get that done tonight and then I'll have two of those four pairs of socks done. Um, so what am I working on in knitting? Obviously I have that sock. Uh, I have cast on for a shawl, but I haven't decided if I'm going to keep it yet or not. It's kind of complex. So we'll find out next time if it's like going to be worked on or not. Um, and the other thing that I am planning on working on, which I will show you quickly is I would like to get my Alanis top finished up. You may remember I started this about a month ago. It's an Elizabeth Smith Knits pattern. It's just a very casual like over top layering piece but would be perfect for this time of year where we're still kind of bouncing back and forth with our temperatures. It's in the 40s at night but like today it's supposed to be 80 during the day but um, Monday it didn't it got to like 59 at the house so can use layers. Um, this one, which I'll of course talk about more once I get finished, looks really bizarre right now because I've got the front finished and it's kind of all wadded up. I'm not quite there on the back. I'm almost there. I have to do the sleeve, the shoulder shaping and the little cap sleeves but that's all I have left to do on this so probably a couple nights worth of work and I should I should have this one ready to go um, this is knit in Harrisville Designs Highland which is their worsted weight in the colorway Jade so one of my favorite kind of woolly yarns all right so that is it for knitting uh, 20 minutes this is gonna be a long one y'all um, let me pause really quickly and clean some stuff up and then we're going to talk books and then cross stitch. I'll be right back. Okay, so this week I have four books to talk to you about. Um, these were, let's see. Uh, let's start with the Kindle book first, The World That We Knew. So this was a book um, that, actually, you know what, I lied to you. I have five books to talk about. Two Alice Hoffmans. Okay, um, so the two Audible books that I read, the first is called The World That We Knew by Alice Hoffman. She's the author of Practical Magic. If you've seen the movie, the book is awesome. Um, I love her writing. I've read several of hers in the last couple of years, and she has more uh, on my to-be-read list. 
This is one of her newer books, and it's a little bit different in that it's more of a historical fiction uh, than her kind of magic-based books. There is a little bit of magic that's pulled in, but um, it's not as prevalent as in her other books. It's set both in Germany and in France during World War II. The main character characters uh, are a young woman, young girl at the beginning of the story who becomes a teenager over the course of the war, whose mother knows that they, she needs to get out of, uh, out of Germany. And so she pulls together all of the treasures that she still has and she finds her daughter a protectorate to take her on the train to visit relatives, their very, very distant relatives in Paris. And so they go, the story unfolds about them going to Paris, meeting the relatives. Um, the young woman who helps them leave Germany also is, her story thread is picked up as part of the story as well. Um, and how she leaves her family and has to make some really hard life choices. Um, as well as the boy that the first young woman falls in love with and kind of how they grow up during the wartime. Um, really well written. The story and the characters are super engaging. I loved this book. I thought it was wonderful. Um, obviously, there's enough of a little bit of magic in it that you have to suspend realism, but... Um, it, it helps advance the story, and if you think of the magic that's associated with this person named Ava, who's the protector, as just being um, that person that we all wish would protect our children, whether you believe that she's been created or summoned or just is the perfect person for the perfect time, um, that's the role that Ava fulfills. So obviously there's a lot of uh, difficult things that come up for these people. All of the main characters are Jewish. They are all trying to obviously escape Nazi Germany um, and not then eventually Nazi occupied France and um, make their way in the world um, amidst all of the uncertainty of knowing if they were going to be able to eat every day or once a week, uh, that they've lost many parts of their family, if not all of their family. Um, certainly the sort of uh, black cloud that hangs over them with the idea that they may get arrested and then deported to a concentration camp. All of that is in this book. Um, but even with all of that horrible those horrible things hanging over our, the characters' heads, um, the book really is about figuring out ways to make it through difficult times, um, the power of family, whether it's a, an, a, like an adopted family, a family you choose, or your family by blood, um, and what it means to extend kindness to other people, all of which I think are very important topics in this day and age. Uh, I also am on Alice Hoffman's uh, newsletter list, which is very fun, and she sends them out, I think, maybe once a month or every six weeks. It's definitely not spammy, um, where she shows photographs of some of the places that she actually went and researched that appear in this book, uh, some photographs of different people who she based some of the characters on. There's one very strong character who's Actually, a, she's a Catholic nun, and she runs an orphanage, and she knows that she's taking in many Jewish children, refugees, and um, there's a point in the book where she has to make a very hard choice to shut the orphanage basically in a matter of hours and figure out where she's going to move these children to and how she's going to accomplish that. And uh, there's a there was a photo of the woman that Alice Hoffman based this character on um, with one of the young children that she had had at the orphanage with her. Um, you know, really 
really powerful stuff and very well written. So um, if that time period is of interest, uh, the story concept is of interest, uh, I, I would highly recommend that one. Uh, the next book I also listened to on Audible, oh, and I should say um, The World That We Knew had a great narrator. It was Judith Light, who has appeared in many different things, but she was Angela Bauer on <laughs> Who's the Boss? She does a, does a great job with the, the storytelling, but a little bit of trivia there. Um, so the next book I read was Blackbird House, which is also by Al Alice Hoffman and was also a Kindle book. Um, interestingly narrated because each of the chapters is a different actor or reader. And this is more similar to a book I read last year of hers called The Red Garden. It doesn't really have any magic in it, but it is about the magic of everyday things. And what it, the story premise is, it traces the life of a house and property that's on the outer reaches of Cape Cod. Uh, and all of the different people who have lived in the house over the years from the original owners who uh, were was a fishing family. Sorry, I'm looking for my Kleenex. Um, all the way up through um, present day time where uh, it's a young woman who's kind of coming to terms with um, getting older and having had a failed marriage and kind of what she wants out of life. So not all of the stories are happy stories. And in fact, there's a lot of, it's not traumatic. It's just things that happen in life. Um, the first family, you know, they build the house. The husband doesn't come back from the sea. Um, the stories are done not evenly generationally meaning not like every 30 years but 50 to 60 something like that um, and then the time compresses a little bit as you get into the 20th century so it runs from the 1600s into the 21st century um, it's a fairly light read but I really enjoyed it I love how she develops the characters and I pretty much will read anything of hers because I enjoy her writing style so if you're also an Alice Hoffman fan, you can pick that one up. It's it's a fun read. Okay, next, The Swans of Fifth Avenue. Um, and I should mention I will link all the Goodreads pages down below for you all if you're interested in any of these books. So this book is historical fiction, and it's kind of told from two perspectives, but it's set in post-war um, so like 1950s, 60s, and very early 1970s, well, let's say through the 70s, um, mostly in New York. And it focuses on this group of socialite women who were all friends, but then they also befriend the author Truman Capote. And it's about his relationship with this group that he called his swans, the Swans of Fifth Avenue. Uh, but most specifically about one woman, Babe Paley, who he had a very close relationship with and then um, just, it, he basically tossed it away with both hands. Um, partially because that's who he was. Uh, he had a hard time kind of not always trying to put himself ahead in the spotlight and didn't care kind of who he stepped on but also by the time that this uh, rift between the two of them happened he was drinking quite a bit and also using a lot of drugs so it follows how their relationship develops kind of through his rise uh, as a as a star writer for the book um in true blood Is that, am i saying that right uh, and then kind of how his literary career fell off as he began to abuse alcohol and drugs further. Um, and it also talks about uh, her relationship to society. She was, um, she worked at fashion magazines and then she also modeled for fashion magazines. She was kind of the... Um, beauty and look that 
people wanted to emulate. And so she and her husband, Bill Paley, who was uh, the CEO of CBS, you know, they had their place in the Hamptons and they had like a villa overseas and they had a yacht. Well, I guess they didn't have a yacht, but they had, you know, their apartment in downtown Manhattan and they could have anything that they wanted, millions and millions of dollars. But ultimately, none of the people in this book are very happy. So it's kind of all about their relationships and how they interacted. And it is based on a, a true, like lot, actual people and the situations that they were in. Um, so kind of an interesting perspective for me. I'm not as well read on history in the late 20th century as perhaps I could or should be. But it was very interesting and kind of fun for me um, because it's a time period that my mom grew up in New York. Um, she lived in, her family lived in Queens. I mean, they were not like downtown Manhattan kind of people. Um, and certainly not at that social level that Babe Paley was. Um, but I look at some of the pictures of my mom and my grandmother and the clothing that they had on kind of, you can see, oh, they got this at Saks Fifth Avenue kind of feel to it. So it was fun that way from a cultural reference um, and well, very well written and researched, I thought. Um, I also didn't know, oh, sorry, In Cold Blood, that's the book name I'm looking for. Uh, I didn't know that much about Truman Capote. Um, I've seen some interviews with him. He's He has a very distinctive voice mannerism set um, which was really you could kind of hear him hear his actual voice in the written dialogue so uh, I thought the author did a very good job of that um, so an enjoyable read there next up nonfiction book called um, Route 66 Still Kicks and this is sort of a travelogue uh, the author and a co-writer uh, rented a Mustang and they drove the car and drove from Chicago, Illinois area, which is where Route 66 began, through to its terminus um, in California on the coast. Their main thought was they were going to try to capture as much of the almost 2,500 miles of Route 66 as they could by driving it, um, but some of it's not drivable anymore. It's been, um, it's now the it's not, not even the beaten path or off the beaten path. It's way off the beaten path. Um, so kind of each of the regions that they go through from Illinois, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and into California um, was fun because I've driven a lot of that times that I would go to work in California. I've driven the stretch from New Mexico to California on the interstate. Um, and just talking about how the changing uh, political climate changed how roads existed um, from the time of uh, sort of the Dust Bowl era where the Okies were trying to leave Oklahoma and go someplace that was not as drought stricken. Um, so like he pulls in the Grapes of Wrath and John Steinbeck's writing, uh, as well as musical references. Obviously, the song about Get Your Kicks on Route 66 brings that up. Nat King Cole, um, Woody Guthrie. Um, how changing automobiles changed how service stations functioned. Uh, this book was just packed with all kinds of the geeky, trivial history facts that I love. Um, so may or may not be of interest to someone who isn't interested in kind of what was rural America in the 30s and into the 40s and then how kind of the super slab highway changed how Americans got from point A to point B, both from a let's go take a vacation level to shipping of goods and tractor trailer um, ship shipping how all of those affected what happened to this road. And because the road in, in some cases has either completely disappeared, I mean, it's the tarmac is all broken up and it's dirt, or the main interstate has been rerouted 
around a small town, what has happened to the town from an economic and social point of view. Uh, it was a very interesting read. I had a lot of time that I turned to my husband and was like, did you know? And I would tell him something and he'd be like, oh, great. Thanks, son. You love that kind of stuff. So, um, so I did enjoy that. And uh, if that's kind of your thing or you want to travel log of kind of the Midwest through the, through the Southwest, enjoy. Uh, finally, a young adult book called The Darkest Part of the Forest. Uh, Holly Black is the author of this one. I really like this book. Um, it is somewhat typical young adult in the sense that there are young adults in it, late teens, who are having some problems fitting in and understanding their lives. In this case, our two main characters are a brother and sister whose parents are kind of hippie musicians. And so they've always lived a life that doesn't have a lot of rules or... Uh, restrictions on them. Um, the book is set in a made-up town um, called Fairford, which everybody knows is at the edge of the fairies' domain. And they have become kind of a tourist attraction because in the darkest part of the forest, hence the title, there is a young man who has been there as long as anyone can remember, who is obviously a fairy with his little pointed ears, and he is encased in a glass coffin. And so the tourists come to see that, but the local kids also, like, that's their hangout place because they've grown up with him, and he never moves, and he never changes, and he never ages. So they, you know, drive their cars out there, and they sit around and have a par have parties and listen to bad music and all of that kind of stuff. And so he's kind of their local touchstone and hangout point. Uh, the main character, I would say, of the two main characters is this young woman who, um, when she was younger, she and her brother decided that they would go out and find fairies to destroy. Uh, the fairies in town... Uh, are supposed to leave the residents alone, but sometimes not only the tourists disappear. So there's some sort of black, blackness, darkness hiding in this story. Um, so that's the setup for the plot. Uh, the coffin gets broken. No one's sure how. They've never been able to break it before. And the young fairy prince disappears. So the two main characters set out to try to find him and to figure out what is going on uh, in Fairyland, that things have changed. And as it turns out, a whole lot of bad stuff is now looming over them. So uh, I won't ruin it for anyone who wants to read it. Uh, I did really enjoy this. It's the first in a series, but not painfully so. It didn't leave you hanging at the end. Um, I really like the fact that the author was able to create young adult characters who, while they did have some sort of typical young adult angsty bits, um, there were some new and interesting twists in how she presented these characters. And I loved the fact that um, she was able to do a little bit of sort of gender bending in terms of how she presented this brother and sister duo. Um, he's kind of the, um, I won't say sweet, but he's the sensitive, more artistic type. And the sister is a total badass. I, I loved her character. So, um, yeah, would highly recommend this one if you like young adult and young adult type fantasy books. Okay, another 20 minutes gone. Let's move on to Cross Stitch. Cross Stitch. I've also worked on quite a bit there. Um, so let's start out with the finished object because I have been slogging along on this and I think y'all have been watching on Instagram wondering will she ever get that done. It is Christmas Morning Pets, which could definitely use a press, but I have not gotten there yet. 
This is a Dimensions Gold Petites kit. I use the Kit Ada and the Kit Floss. Uh, for its size, it sure took me long enough, but I think it came out great. I love the detail in it, and I think it's absolutely adorable. And looks like my Lizzie and my Emma. Emma's actually a tuxedo cat. She's not tabby, but she's black and white, which is close enough. Um, and they they do sometimes actually sleep like this. When we, not this dog, but our previous dog, we got her and Emma at, the, at just about the same time, like maybe three months apart. And the puppy that we got, she was a very noisy sleeper. She would have a lot of dreams where she would be in her crate, curled up, you know, on her dog towel bed thing. And she would be like running in her sleep and whimpering. And Emma would go over and reach through the, the bars of her crate and pat the puppy while she slept until she quit whining. So she definitely loves her doggy friends. Anyway, sidebar. Uh, lots of backstitch in this one. Um, a few French knots. Nothing super difficult about this one other than that it is pretty much full coverage. Um, I mean, it's got an uneven edge, but everything here with the exception of these bright white spots is, is stitched. Uh, I cannot completely say that I got every single one of these little backstitch furry bits perfect, but all is good because it's done. So this was project 18 of 20 in my finish or stitch 20 in 20 project. And you will see the other two, which are not finished, but I have three months, so I'm feeling like I can get it done. Uh, I will probably finish this into some sort of a cushion. Um, I don't think I'm going to try to like follow the edge around. I think that would look odd and be very difficult to get right, especially like little pointy bits. So I think I'm going to do like a square cushion and back it with maybe some green velveteen or red velveteen. My mom sent me two little, they're maybe that size, so like half of this pillows a couple of years ago that have like cat and dog Santa wishes lists on them and uh, they're stitched but not by me and not by her she store bought them and that's how they're finished with like a gold cording uh, to hang them with and I have them out together so I thought this would be kind of cute with that um, I also have some kind of rusty jingle bells and I may do that as well I don't think I'll I'll frame it, frame it. Um, but anyway, this is done. Which I'm very happy about. <laughs> All right, that is my finish to show you guys for this go round. Next, let's talk about this, which I was working on last time we talked, which is my desert mandala piece. This is going on my frame next for the beginning of October because what I want to do is um, there's a cactus that needs to happen here and then there's the snake that needs to go in here and then this will be done from here up so from the cactus on either side up that was my goal for the year not to have the whole thing finished just to finish the top 25% and I'm almost there. I'm so close. I feel like I can get this get this one checked off the list in the that is done this month. Um, so that's what that's what my plan is for this. So last time I worked on this cactus, um, I as you might remember or maybe not, I could not find some of the beads I needed to use for the snake. So I have reordered those. They are here. So I will go back and work on the bead beaded part here. That's really all I have to do on this. So um, I've gotten this section and this one done this year, or will have this one done this year, as well as the corner motifs and these sections. This is a Chatelaine design. I'm stitching it on 28 count even weave from hand dyed bites. No, picture this plus 
in the colorway Calypso, which I love. I think it makes all of the like, purples and greens and then these rusts really pop. So loving that. You will see that then next time I talk to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then what I have been working on and will work on this afternoon um, to just make some more progress on is Joan Elliott's Winter Fairy. Here she is. Um, okay, so status report on this. This is also one that I want to have completely finished this year. I wanted to have this section done before the end of September. It is not going to happen because I am out of this light color and I'm out of this, no, I'm out of this light color and I'm out of the medium purple. I have the dark purple left, but I only have like 10 stitches left to put in it. So I was talking to Kim over at Spartan Stitcher uh, two days ago, I guess it was, you know, moaning and groaning about this fact. And she happened to be going to get some things framed. So she said, oh, I'll look and see if I can find the floss, which she was able to find. It, one of the colors had been on back order. So I don't know when I'll, I've put it in order for it, but I don't know when I'll get it. So she was able to find the two colors I need and she's mailing them to me and they should be here Saturday. So after I finish Desert Mandala, I'm coming back to work on this. I would like to get all of the cross stitch finished on her skirt um, in the month of October. So that's going to be finishing all this purple. You can see right here, this is one bunny ear and this is the second bunny ear. So I've started the bunnies. This section right here with, uh, there's a little bit of back stitching in here left to do is completely done. So right here, the bottom kind of comes across. And so I think what I'm going to focus on next time I have this out is I want to finish the purple. Um, and then I'm going to, there's a whole bunch of white that's, that she's standing on. That's like white snow drifts. See if I can bang through that because we all know stitching white is not the most fun thing in the world. Um, and then go back and finish. I don't really have that much left to do of this section right here. It, there's like a swirly, uh, ribbon trim thing down here at the bottom. So if I can get all the cross stitching done in October, that will then leave me, you can see I've got um, this part, like these star brocade things. I need to put them in on the purple. Obviously I have to have the stitching done in order to add that in. And there's a few others that are kind of like sparkles of light floating around down here. And then the beads. Now there are a fair amount of beads um, up here. There's kind of two swirling bits that will, be, that will be beads. And then the white spots that you see in the purple dress are beaded. Um, beads go in here and then there's beads, pearl beads down here in the snow. So I'm thinking that that detailing and the beading will wind up taking me the month of November. It would be great to have this finished before December, but I'm leaving myself December as my fallback, backup, oh my gosh, I can't get this done in two months plan. Uh, this is being stitched on 28 count even weave, uh, the July 2017 color and cotton club fabric. It doesn't have another name. The called for DMC Karnik. Uh, I did have some beads in stash, the little pearl seed beads, so I didn't order more. I'm just going to use the ones I have because they're the right size. Uh, what more can I tell you about this? Joan Elliott design. Uh, yeah, looks looks like it's almost there, but you know, these, these just take a very long time to work on. Um, and then as a final tidbit... Hmm. I also finished a page on my Long Winter's Nap ornament. This is a Heaven and Earth Designs chart, uh, artwork by Donna Gelsinger. And this is, again, the ornament version. I am stitching this on my usual favorite, which is 25 count um, pre-gridded fabric. 
obviously the DMC, and I have finished this page right here. So I think next time I get this out, I'm going to try to get this page done. It's not a full, it's not a quite a full page, but it would get me to about here. So I can get to that edge, which would be here. Um, no plans specifically to work on this the rest of this year because my goal was just to get this page finished, but with Christmas in the next three months, uh, I may pull it out to work on for some like December end of the year winter slash North Pole slash Christmas slash Santa prompts, but we'll see how far I get on other things and what else I want to try to work on. But love the detail in this. I think it looks so good. Um, so this page finish was also one of my stitch 20 and 20 goals. So like I said, the two I have left are the Desert Mandala and Winter Fairy. And so they're going to kind of be my focuses uh, this month. I do want to get that upper corner of the Desert Mandala finished. By the way, we're going to talk plans right now in case you hadn't realized I had morphed into that. Um, so I want to get that taken care of. Again, I want to try to get as much, if not all, of the cross stitch done on Winter Fairy. I'll be pulling out uh, Once Upon a Fairy Tale, uh, my my massive supersized max color from Hade and Amy Stewart for the Russia prompt in Full Coverage Fanatics. We're going to be arounding the world to Russia this month. Um, and since it's my largest project, it's going to match Russia as the largest place we're visiting. So that will be my choice to pull for that one. Um, might might get a page finish on that if I calculated right. Uh, the page I'm working on is slightly larger because it's a full size page and then there's a little bit stripped down at the bottom so it's not exactly the same number as everything else. Uh, that's a normal page for, the, for them. Uh, but we'll see. I think it'll be pretty close if I don't actually get to that page finish point. Um, hang on, let me get my book and see what else. <clears throat> October. Yeah, I'm like a month behind. Um, I think that's it for immediate plans for cross stitch. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Sagebrush is in bloom in September in New Mexico and it's a little bit late this year because it was kind of dry and so I'm just yeah like sneezy the dwarf um sorry about that okay so uh yeah I think that's it for today uh ongoing plans just gonna try to get a whole bunch of stuff finished up Keep my eye on the prize for the projects that I've got on the go. If I can get Winter Fairy done, and if I can get Desert Mandala done, um, I am going to look at trying to get some good stitches in on a stitching shelf. But in order to get that top row done, I have a whole page and a half to finish, and I'm not sure I'll get there. We'll find out. Uh, so I will be back to talk to you. Hopefully it won't be 20 days because I think this is going to be super long and hopefully y'all are enjoying the long ones because uh, that's what this one's going to be. So until I talk to you next time, I hope that you all are staying safe, staying well, and being kind to one another. We'll talk to you uh, in October. Take care, y'all. Bye.